Welcome to Face to Face. This is a show about change and about what's next. It's a show that wants to ask questions, peel back the layers of our average everyday experience, and go beyond scratching the surface. We interview amazing people with incredible ideas and stories who have done wild, weird, and wonderful things. Remember that imagination shared create collaboration, and collaboration creates community, and community inspires social change. I'm David Peck, and this is Face to Face. So my next interview is with uh, two guys who are, well, this, uh, who, who, two guys who clearly love comedy and who uh, love having some fun together. They've got a podcast that they're coming out with very soon, Amar Walla and Galad Cohen. They both have really interesting pasts, and, and they're both... Uh, can I say they're fascinated by the whole notion of human rights? But apparently they hang out in pubs, uh, they drink beer and talk about human rights issues uh, a fair bit. And what they want to do is they want to rebrand the human rights conversation. And I know that sounds kind of silly on some level and, and kind of odd, but it's really interesting as we talk and we unpack that together. Uh, and, and like I say, they've got a podcast coming out called The Hum uh, in the very near future. And think, In fact, I think it's uh, airing this week, March 13th, 2016. Check it out online. I think you're going to really enjoy this interview. There's a lot of fun stuff going on. You're going to hear a little bit about JIU, a, a nonprofit organization that's all about human rights here and the Human Rights Film Festival. We're going to talk about Amar's uh, film called The Secret Trial 5 that premiered at, at, at Hot Docs not that long ago. So join us, listen in, and don't forget davidpecklive.com for more podcasts. Check out my book, Real Change is Incremental, and looking forward uh, to hearing some feedback on, on our next podcast with Amar, Walla, and Galad Cohen. Well, welcome to Face to Face, and we are joined today by two very special guests, uh, Gilad Cohen, the director of JU, and I'm, I'm going to let you, Gilad, tell us a little bit more about who you are and what you do, and Amar, Walla, and same, but guys, first of all, thanks for joining me uh, today on Face to Face. Thanks so much uh, for having us. Wonderful yeah, opportunity. So, so tell me, for, you know, why don't why don't you tell me a little bit about yourselves? Because I mean, uh, Gilad Ju is pretty cool. Human rights, film, arts, photography. Tell me a little bit about that, and I'm hoping Omar is going to interrupt you from time to time with some interesting tidbits. And then I want to start talking about an initiative you guys are about to launch, which is also really cool. So, so, so tell me a little bit more about you, and about what you're doing with with Ju. Why don't we start in alphabetical order? You know, why don't we have uh, Amar uh, go in? Because I'm interested in learning about him. Actually, he's my co-host, <laughs> and I, I feel like I know nothing about him. You know nothing about him. Awesome. So co-host. So you clearly, let's talk about that. Let's just throw it out there. So, so uh, Gilad and Amar are going to be hosting a podcast called The Hum. It's it's opening. Uh, you guys are launching in about a week's time, March 16th. Um, and and uh, so Amar, tell tell me more about yourself and about the podcast. Sure, yeah. Um, so I am a filmmaker by trade, mm -hmm. and um, most of my work uh, tends to revolve around issues of human rights and social justice in some way, shape, or form. And uh, I had the pleasure of not screening at Galad's Film Festival a couple of years ago <laughs> because he didn't, he didn't pick my film. So, so um, hang on, Amar, can I just interrupt? Is that how this whole yeah. interview is going to go? Is it going to be like little pot shots back and forth for the next 30 minutes? Is that what we're talking about here? Probably. I think you know, each of us has kind of learned in the short time that we've been doing this that we don't really like the other person. So um, That's awesome. No, I'm, I'm, I'm just kidding, of course. But it's, it's, you know, it's nice to actually get a chance to be interviewed. And it's kind fun. of, I think it's kind of telling that our initial instincts are just to make fun of each other. Yes. Uh, now, that, now that we're sitting on the other side. It's so pretty, that it's, should tell you something about I the think dynamic on the I'm Actually, I'm texting my therapist as we speak, so I'll, uh, <laughs> I'll get back to you on that, what she has to say. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I, I'm a filmmaker by yep. trade, and uh, my first feature film was called The Secret Trial 5, and it, it premiered at Hot Docs in 2014. Cool. And it basically told the story of uh, the campus use of security certificates, which were a tool that were used to detain terror suspects in Canada post 9-11 in a way that uh, we didn't really think as Canadians that we would act. So uh, we held uh, these five men without charge. We held them for indefinite periods of time without releasing the evidence against them. Even their lawyers weren't able to see the evidence against them. 
and they ended up spending nearly 30 years in jail combined under these security certificates. So that was kind of my entry into the professional film world and also into the human rights world because I'd never heard about that topic. And through that work, I got to know uh, other people kind of telling these kinds of stories and meet people like Vlad, who uh, part of JIU is their flagship program is, uh, is an amazing film festival that they run every December. So, um, through, and let know, me let me jump in. Let me jump in because, yeah. like, all things aside, you, you'll hear it like on the podcast, and even when Amar and I are just having a beer, having a coffee, I will rip into them and say, you know, we didn't take your film because it wasn't a good one. But all jokes aside, it's a wonderful, very eye-opening film, uh, and a lot of times really shocking, uh, just to see what's happening here in our own uh, our own country. So, Secret Trial Five, amazing film, uh, amazing director. So sorry, Amar. What's the name of the film again? Seeker. Secret, secret. the secret, yeah, the secret, secret trial, trial five. five. Okay, good, thanks. They, that's actually the name that the human rights community gave them because of the way the trial process actually happened. So what would happen is that the defense would present their case first in this national security context, and then the prosecution would literally go behind closed doors without the defense lawyers or the person being accused and present their case to the judge in secret. And so... That's where that name kind of came from. The very Kafkaesque process that we kind of document in the film, mm. so and kind of an ugly chapter in, in Canadian history. Sure, sure, no doubt, no doubt. So, so Amar, why, why? So you clearly, both of you are, are connected on a variety of levels. You're friends. You're going to be doing this podcast together. You're, you're, you've got an interest in film and photography and the arts and clearly human rights. Why for you? And I think I'm going to ask the question of Gillette as well. Why, why human rights? Why didn't, why didn't you uh, write the f- pilot episode of The Big Bang Theory? <laughs> um, I think, you know, it's, it's interesting. I, I never thought I'd be making... I never really thought I'd be making documentaries when I was okay. in film school, to be honest. All okay. of my training was in narrative film. And I was, you know, I was obsessed with film just as a movie buff. That's kind of where my love for cinema kind of began. It wasn't these human rights stories. It wasn't until I got into my early 20s and started to become more politically aware. And then George Bush decided to invade Iraq. <laughs> and, you know, I was in college at that time. And so I started really thinking about how, how the world really works, how these power dynamics in the world really work. But also, you know, I just noticed that my family's from India. Originally, I was born there. Um, I'm a, I'm a brown skinned man. I started to notice that, uh, things weren't going so well for, for men who kind of look like my dad or look like mm-hmm. me in, in Canada and in the United States in, in the first few years after nine 11. So that really kind of changed that it really kind of had an impact on the types of stories I wanted to sure. tell. So my final short film when I was at York as a film student was about one of the families that I document in my feature documentary. And it was a narrative film. It was a drama about, it was a father son story about uh, a night when the young boy is asked to translate for his father while uh, Canadian authorities kind of interrogated his father in their home. And so that to me was a really powerful moment, you know, in the life of a 10 or 11 year old boy where you're, you know, translating into Arabic while the government is threatening your dad. Um, So after that, it just became harder and harder to, you know, write things like the big bang. (laughs) So, um, and I find these stories, you know, truth is, is almost stranger than fiction. Mm -hmm. Some of the stories that Mm -hmm. I've documented, if I was to just write them, uh, people wouldn't believe me. They'd say this is just way too far-fetched and strange and out there. Um, but they only work because they're real, right? They, they work because the things people really go through are, in a way, so much crazier than anything I could think of from a creative standpoint. And so it just had this impact on me, and I slowly started telling those stories, and I never looked back. Yeah, no, it's interesting. I'm always, you know, I mean, my, my thing is, is incrementalism. Little things make a big difference, splash and ripple, you know, why, you know, we're all making change of one kind or another. Some of us are just a little bit more intentional about it than others. Some of us are more passionate. Some of us are more committed and, and we all sort of choose our weapons, you know, sorry for the metaphor. It's a horrible one, but you, you, you know what I'm saying? And, and it always fascinates me to find out when you look back you know, what are the connecting dots? What was it? Was it a childhood experience? Was it a, a book? Was it a film? Was it a, a, you know, did you get scared out of your wits as a result of an experience that, that, that allowed you to go down a different path? And I think, I think sometimes it, 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 it's worthwhile, you know, as we move forward and take our, our new risks to look back from time to time to go, holy smokes, look, look what I did in order to get here. 
right? And and mm-hmm. look, look what I had to 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 work through in order to get here. Gilad, how about you? What why human rights? Why aren't you doing a fashion film festival? Well, I tried to do a fashion film, but it failed <laughs> yeah. uh, so miserably. So uh, it's it's interesting to say because it's a lot of uh, personal experiences, like you just mentioned. And I like to I like to somehow say, or sometimes say, that uh, my connection to human rights almost started like 80 years ago with mm. uh, with my grandmother growing up in Romania. So she's uh, we grew up in a Jewish household. She was Jewish, and uh, when she was at the age of three, her father uh, was executed by uh, we we don't know. Like it's it's been. Uh, we've looked into it, but we can't figure it out whether it's been Nazis or Nazi sympathizers. And so, hmm. uh, you know, she grew up in that whole time period and, and growing up as as, uh, as a child in my house, we heard stories all the time about yeah. suffering and how it's so ingrained in our history as, as Jewish people. And so uh, I kind of grew up with that whole, uh, whole thing uh, surrounding me. And so uh, it kind of all came together, I would say, uh, on a trip I took to North Korea in 2007. I, I went there for, for a day trip. It was incredibly bizarre. I feel like we could dedicate an entire podcast episode to my just 12 hours there. But how, hold, hold on. How do you take a day trip to North Korea? So back in 2000, it's bizarre. And, I know, right? Like yeah. a lot of people don't know that, that this was even a thing, but back in 2007, <laughs> right. when uh, the relationship between South and North Korea were, was a bit warmer, okay. when I say a bit warmer, I still say uh, freezing cold. <laughs> freezing cold, but, right. Slightly yeah. a bit warmer. Yeah. They opened up the, 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 the DMZ border okay. and allowed uh, sort of guided tour buses to take uh, groups of people from South Korea into North Korea for, for just a day. So uh, they took us to a city called Kaesong, uh, which I think is the second largest city in North Korea. And it was completely guided. Like, we don't have any freedom to explore, to go and, and do our own thing, where we were guided by, by North Korean guards the whole time. And so I can't really tell you that there's anything I, I saw there that you probably don't already know if you're, if you're reading the news or if you're watching any of these sort of vice documentaries on North Korea. I didn't see a concentration camp. I didn't see people obviously suffering in front of me. But the trip in itself was very bizarre in that there were very tight restrictions on what we could do, who we could speak with, where we could go, what we could take pictures of. And it it just so happened to be that, I think it was like uh, two or three months after I did that trip, uh, a South Korean woman uh, was on the same tour that we were on, and she walked past one of those trees that they tell you, don't walk past, and uh, and they shot her in the back of the head and killed her. And so uh, it was just this, I think, like short three or four month period that these tours were running, and of course they stopped. So yeah. Anyway, coming back to, to South Korea, I started, I started researching about North Korea. Uh, and then what I learned really related to my roots, uh, things to do with concentration camps and suffering and, and all that kind of stuff. And so in, in some ways, although I'm not, uh, I'm not North Korean and I'll never be able to relate to that struggle, a lot of the things that they're going through uh, are sort of ingrained in my history. And right, so I right. felt that sort of personal connection to it. And so... I, I just want to say, I have, like, a very obsessive personality. Like, if I'm on Instagram, I'm really on Instagram. If I get a tattoo, it's like, i got to get a million tattoos. And it was the same thing with North Korea. Like, I became obsessed with learning as much as I could and just getting other people to, to empathize and to learn as well. And so the, the roots of Jai sort of started in that. Okay. It started with uh, North Korean human rights awareness, and then it just sort of uh, grew and, and broadened from there. And Jai is the Korean word for freedom, yes? Yeah, exactly. So uh, originally we were called the, the North Korean Human Rights Film Festival, which is an atrocious uh, acronym, uh, an, an atrocious name to try to market. But we've, when we broadened, we went into, uh, we, we chose the name Jayu because it means freedom in Korean, which is uh, sort of the mission of our organization. So, so I'm not, I guess I can throw this question out to either of you. I mean, I'm, I'm starting to think that, and, and you, Omar, as a filmmaker, uh, probably will have an opinion on this, but I think you could parachute pretty much anywhere in the world into a community and you could make a film about somebody, about some, so in other words, there, there's, there's, everyone's got a story, right? Everyone, it seems to me, has a story to tell. We could all benefit in one way or another from, from, uh, from listening to others and from being immersed in somebody else's community, somebody else's context, somebody else's culture, and somebody else's worldview. I mean, I love the fact that Gillard's story started 80, 80, 80, Gillard's story started 80 years ago. Like, that just, it's amazing. Yeah, I, I think I agree with that. I mean, there's, 
it's part of the, what I was talking about earlier with the whole truth is stranger than fiction thing. I mean, yes. people's stories, no matter how um, mundane it may be to them, because that's their experience. Um, I think that's something that we can all kind of learn from. And they're part of the, I think, artistic mind of, of people who kind of tell these types of stories is that they, you know, good filmmakers, I think, can actually just see the story in, uh, in anything that's going on in real life. And so I think everyone does have a story. I think it's important for filmmakers, like, you know, not that I've been doing this long enough to really give other filmmakers advice, but I think it's important to really kind of figure out the types of stories that you really want to tell. Like, what are the stories that really, like, draw you to do the work? Because, you know, whether it's making these films or running a film festival or even just having a podcast, these things are hard to do, mm. right? And it's, 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 you never know for sure if, there's, if anyone's going to watch your film or if anyone's going to listen to your podcast. And so the making of it, the doing of it has to be its own reward. It has to be the process that really engages you. It can't just be about the reward at the end because that reward might never come. And so it's really important, I think, for all of us to figure out what it is we want to do pretty early in our artistic lives. And for me, it was telling these kinds of stories because regardless of whether the films do well or, you know, my name as an artist kind of grows, mm -hmm. I've spent all of this time kind of telling stories and sharing stories that are deeply engaging to me and I think make me a smarter and better person every time I kind of work on them. So that to me is the value of, of what we all kind of do when we're blending arts and human rights. And I feel like I'm not going to, I'm not going to say anything much more profound than what Amar said. I think that was beautifully put, but I think the other importance and the value in what we do do is the fact that we are uh, providing a platform for other people who often don't have mm. a way to share these stories sure. to be able to do so. Because like you say, everyone does have a story. But not everyone has the privilege or the space. And when I say space, I, I want to say like a safe, a safe space, free from judgment, to be able to share that story, like free from stigma, free from criticism. Uh, so that's the other value in, in a lot of the work that Amar and other filmmakers and artists do do is that they, they provide that platform for the people to be able to share. So, so both of you, talk to, me, talk to me a little bit about hope. I mean, you guys are living in a world, it seems to me, you know, uh, Gilad told me that, you, what is it, 300 films you guys go through before, when, that are submitted to the festival? Yeah, hope, hope is when you have 300 films submitted and, and you feel like you're not going to get through it. Uh, <laughs> hope is, that, is when that last film is being played. That's uh, right. When you got, got out of it. Yeah, but we, it but, grows every year. Uh, last year we did have 300 films, uh, close to 300 films submitted. Uh, well, festival. so so you sit there, you watch these many films, you're making these kinds of films, you're you're working in, you know, I guess on one level you want to go, hold on a second here, 21st century, what do you mean there's human rights problems around the world, and yet we both know what a ridiculous statement that is. And so you look in this, you know, you don't have to read too far, uh, uh, you know, you don't even have to be a member of Amnesty International or, 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 or uh, you know, go too deep into the news to realize there, there are pretty much problems in, you know, every country around the world. So, uh, so how do you guys, and maybe you don't, I don't know, but how do you maintain hope? How do you say, you know what, things are getting better. We are, or maybe you're going to tell, tell me they're not, they're getting worse. You know, I mean, you know, uh, you, you, you had, you had 12 hours in North Korea. You must have some insight here. I would say for us, it's a lot more on a micro level. Um, if you look, if you look at, at, at things on a macro level, it's easy to get discouraged and to yep. see that things aren't changing. But if you sort of dive deeper and sort of, uh, you know, look into the situation and, and pluck out those individual human stories and see how people have overcome whatever nice. challenge it was, it's easier to find hope. Like our podcast is coming out next week and we have uh, a person who, who grew up in North Korea. And in a lot of ways, the situation there seems entirely hopeless. Yeah. Uh, it seems like nothing there's really changed in the last 50 years. Maybe the only thing that's changed is that now they have a, a nuclear bomb. But uh, when we dove into this individual story, we were able to, you know, hear how he was able to escape. And, and even though he's out now, he's able to still support his family on the inside. And he's going to school and, and he's, he's growing in, in so many ways. That right there is hope. Um, so it's, it's, it's easy to, to lose track of that or to lose sight of that if, if you look on a, on a broader level. But I think what's important is to look at it case by case and, and see who... Who are the people on the ground that are mm. shifting that sort of change and, and uh, involved in it? I mean, I think for me, uh, I'm actually kind of full of hope all the time. I, I, I think that all of these stories aren't, I don't see these stories as kind of um, telling us about uh, the dark side of the world and how ugly everything is. 
I think that all of these stories for me end with this great big deal of hope because mm. <clears throat> regardless of of you know whether we're sharing the story of one individual who's had a really rough time or a group of people that is being persecuted at this point in time, the world is constantly becoming a better place to live. That's just the reality of it. I mean, if you look at history and if you look at uh, the, where we were 50 years ago, the world is a much safer, kinder, gentler, happier place than it was that long ago. Now, we don't realize that because of the way we report on things like crime and all these stories that are coming at us all the time make us feel like the world is just this awful place all the time and there's just so much suffering. And that's still very true. But today is the safest, happiest, best day in the history of humankind. And tomorrow is going to be today. That's the, mm. that's the reality. Those are the facts. If you look at crime statistics, those are the facts. If you look at statistics on things like terrorism, those are the facts. Those are the things we focus on. But we've, I mean, literally had, what, two terror attacks in the last 12 years in this country uh, by individual men who are both suffering from mental health issues. Like, um, so I think the important thing is not to lose sight of the big picture. And the big picture is that we are finally starting to talk about things that 50 years ago we didn't talk about. So people who were young 50 years ago may think that life was simpler then, but life was simpler then because you weren't talking about the problems. It's really simple when mm. you don't talk about it or when right. you don't deal with things like police brutality or you don't acknowledge systemic racism. Yeah, the world seems great because you're not acknowledging the actual issues. But the fact that we are actually starting to talk about systemic racism in, things, in places like Toronto, which is sort of supposed to be this diverse mm -hmm. multicultural beacon that the whole world is supposed to emulate, you know, the fact that we're starting to have these conversations, the fact that we're starting to have gender parity, the National Film Board of Canada just came out yesterday saying that it is going to mandate gender parity in the filmmakers that it, that it funds. 50% of the filmmakers are going to have to be women. Now, should they have had to do that in 2016? Should that not just be a natural thing? Of course it should be. But the fact that they saw the problem and addressed it is a huge move forward for us in our industry. And I think that every day the world is becoming a slightly better place. It's, slightly, it's becoming a slightly more smarter, slightly more tolerant place. It's a, it's a very slow-moving train, man. Progress yes. does not happen quickly. But in the grand scheme of things, the world is getting better. And I think that it's very important that we remember that when we do this work. Unless you're listening to a Republican presidential debate. <laughs> right, but even that, even that stuff is great because, I mean, those guys are getting more and more marginalized, right? So um, I don't think anyone believes in their right mind that whoever the Republican candidate is, that they're going to win. No one actually believes that. So um, we may end up being wrong in November or whenever the election comes up. But yes. if you look at the other side, the let's, fact that... Let's remember this conversation when they're swearing Donald Trump in, in, uh, what is it, a year's I, time? <laughs> I, will, I will sincerely apologize. I'll call in and apologize. To you That's right. That we'll, hey, but we'll, we'll do a we'll follow-up then, Amar. Let's yeah. flip that on, on its head for a second. Yeah. Bernie Sanders, a self-described democratic socialist, is a legitimate candidate for president mm -hmm. in the United States of America. Mm -hmm. He mm -hmm. is virtually tying Hillary, he is tying a Clinton in just about every state they go into. That's huge. That's huge. Who would have thought that would happen 10 mm -hmm. years ago? Unless it's anything down in the South. Unless it's anything down in the South. Yeah, and, but that's, that's fine. I mean, I think that that's pretty obvious. But when you, when you think about the money he's up against, the amount of power he's up against, it's true. the name recognition of just her, of her name, Hillary Clinton, the fact that he's doing so well against her in major states with huge populations is huge, right? Like that says a lot about mm -hmm. young voters. That says a lot about young people in America who are not afraid of that, you know, quote unquote socialist title. They're not afraid of changing the way America is doing things. I think that gives us a ton of hope for the future, even if, if Sanders loses. That's good. Let's go back. I want to go back to what you said, Amara, about, about Canada, you know, supposedly in this diverse place. Uh, National Film Board, you brought up, I think, at the same time. So National Film Board, uh, I, I had the uh, pleasure of interviewing Mina Shum and Selwyn Jacob, uh, their, uh, their film Ninth Floor. I don't know if you've seen it. Uh, but it was, I haven't seen it, but I've heard wonderful things. Yeah, about. it's very good. You really do need to see it. It's quite a piece of art, but it's also a really important film. It was about the um, Sir George Williams University riot. Uh, 1969. I was four years old. Uh, turned into turned into quite the thing. And as you're watching it, you kind of go, "Hold on a second here. This is like the Deep South, right? This is Absolutely. you know, you whoa. This is Montreal. This is Canada." And so, I mean, I, and and talking to some of the people at NFB about this before I actually did the interview, it was really fascinating because we watch that and we think there's almost this Canadian um, hmm, hubris, arrogance, or something about, well, we're peacekeepers after all, right? And, and the reality is, I, 
I'm not sure that we're that much different in some respects. I mean, I want to ask you both about that. Here you are, you know, both in this field, social justice, human rights, you're doing the festival, Jayu, et cetera. Are people really talking about it or are we really just preaching to the converted? Uh, I mean, I think for the most part, um, we are preaching to the converted, but, you know, I had an old film professor who used to say that, you know, don't worry about preaching to the converted because even the converted need their faith restored every once in a while. <laughs> That's so, good. Um, I like it. I, I, I think that, I think that you're right, that, that Canadian mythmaking has been so ingrained in the way we do things. I mean, if you actually did an analysis of our history, even as peacekeepers, every peacekeeping mission we went on, there was an ulterior motive that was either economic or um, military in nature. So that history is not Canada's real history. Um, and I think that we are, this is the other reason why I always have hope, right? Because we are finally talking, starting to talk about the holes within this concept of Canadian multiculturalism, right? We're finally starting to talk about things like systemic racism mm -hmm. in Canada. And I think that, yes, most Canadians are going to reject those notions early on and say, well, that's not us. That's the stuff the Americans do. This is something I faced very regularly when I premiered my film. Uh, you know, anti-terrorism stuff is the stuff Americans do. Canadians don't do that kind of thing. Um, but, of course, we do. And I think that these conversations are starting to happen more regularly in Canada. And so... That gives me a lot of hope. I think there's still a lot of work for us to do to truly acknowledge that the problems that we see existing in the rest of the world also exist here. And I think that the reason it's hard to have that conversation is because, you know, life for most people in Canada is actually pretty good, right? Mm. Uh, we understand, like my mom always says, my mom is an immigrant from India, and she says, you know what, Amar, no matter what you make, like in your films, I'm proud of your films, but remember Canada is still one of the best countries in the world to live. And she's right about that. But that can't be a reason for us to not keep moving forward. That can't be a reason for us to be complacent and not want to actually change the problems that still exist, right? So I think that you're right. Like, Canada does have this bit of hubris, and that's something we need to shake ourselves out of. But, you know, that's kind of, if I can be frank, that's why I make my movies. I yeah, make my movies yeah. for the Canadian audience. So It's good. And very well put. I mean, I was going to say, like, how annoying is it when you hear of, like, a hate crime happening here in Canada, and our first response is to say, oh, this is not us. Right. It's not who yeah, we are. This is not what we do. Annoying. Well, and, so, even, I mean, I think that's, that's, and I think even if, if we don't, I think, I think, and this is why I said, and I never thought of it this way, the arrogance, but I think there's a, there's a, sanct, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? A sanctimonious kind of edge that says, oh, we would never behave that way collectively, right? And so... I'm not sure we're actually getting down below the surface, if that makes sense. In fact, well, I, mean, I know we're not. I know we're not. Never mind, I'm not sure. I'm trying to be too polite here. <laughs> there you go. You're being super Canadian, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. <laughs> no, but the thing is, I think that, you know, sometimes it actually takes someone pushing the country so far in the wrong direction uh, to actually get us talking that in a weird way, you know, the one good thing that came out of Stephen Harper's years in office was that People who thought Canada was this wonderful multicultural uh, mosaic and did everything right were finally starting to pay attention to some of the truly crazy things that Canada was doing uh, under the Harper regime, right? So if there's one positive that came out of that is that we started talking about our problems because we couldn't stand this guy that was leading us. The problem now is that everyone is getting sucked back into Trudeau's sunny ways thing. And so we're constantly, we're right back to where we were talking about, we're, we're returning to where Canada was. Canada is this peacekeeper. Canada is this uh, sort of multicultural beacon. And we're starting to return to that. And Trudeau is bringing us back to that. And that to me is hugely problematic, right? Like that's, that's we, what we voted for essentially is a change in tone rather than an actual substantive change. Right, so right. So I'm hoping that this isn't just that whatever we face politically over the next few years isn't just about the tone and the language we use, but about actual change and actually acknowledging some of the problems that exist within Canada. It remains to be seen what will happen over the next few years, but at least I know that there's a generation of young Canadians who kind of came of age under Stephen Harper, and they're definitely paying attention. So that gives me a lot of hope. It's good. I love conversations that, uh, even though they're talking about uh, the realities of, you know, everyday life, making contact with reality in meaningful ways still wind up uh, with, with a l at least a little bit of hope. 
because as I, I I don't know about you guys, but I, I consider myself to be a hopeful cynic. I uh, you know I've certainly said that before on, on on many of my podcasts, and my listeners will know that, and uh, my students, and so on. But I think there's something you know. Life is paradox. It seems to me life is contradiction. You know, it's. Uh, I used to work with a guy in construction years ago who his phrase was "It doesn't be easy," and I've always loved that phrase. It doesn't be easy. It doesn't be easy. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's a good tagline for, uh, for something. So, so listen, tell me about your podcast. It's coming out, um, uh, next week. It's called the hum. You've, you've, it sounds like you've already got a few. You, you just talked briefly about, about one of your guests coming up. Tell, tell me a little bit more about what, what the goal is, what the intention is and, and where it's going to air and all that kind of stuff. Let's, let's get a little practical right now. Oh, by the way, website address, uh, Gilad is J J A Y U dot C A. J A Y U dot C A. That's the yep. Yeah, that's the website for uh, the organization. But the hum uh, is on the hum podcast dot com or the hump podcast dot com, whichever uh, you're in the mood to go to. <laughs> the hump podcast dot com. Yes, that's where it got me there quickly. That's cool. <laughs> that's cool. So uh, the hum, I think, just given uh, given the nature of both Amar and I's work, we. We're always surrounded by people with these interesting sort of stories to share. And so uh, we sort of looked at each other one day and we're like, why don't we get these people uh, onto a platform to be able to share them? And so we decided to host uh, a podcast, which I know is, is uh, a very original idea these days. But <laughs> basically... <laughs> You're on the right track, so, though. The whole premise of the hum is that uh, everyone around us has a human rights story to share. Uh, yep. It could be... Uh, a victim of violence. It could be someone who's wrongfully imprisoned for X amount of years. It could be a refugee who's escaped from another country. So the, the, the purpose of this podcast is to get these people on, uh, on our program to be able to share those stories, but also in a very sort of ca- casual, uh, relaxed setting. Because we found, uh, I think, Omar, as, as a, a filmmaker and myself working in, uh, with a, a film festival, Anytime a human rights story is shared, it's often uh, in a very serious, mm. sometimes stuffy tone, which I think, uh, if I'm going to speak personally, sometimes pushes people away. Hmm. Uh, Interesting. People might not be in the mood to, to talk about it, but what we know when we're working with these people is everyone, or not everyone, but most people have, uh, you know, really humorous sides to them as well. So what we try to do with the hum is to try to bring that side out while also being respectful to maybe some of the things that they've gone through. Uh, and, and in a very casual setting, sort of like picture two two friends discussing human rights or politics in a pub. Right. I would say that that's the best way to define uh, what this podcast is all about. Yeah, and I think to add to what Galad just said, you know, it's amazing to me in the work that I've done how when you interview people who have been through really difficult situations, just how much perspective they have, just how funny they are, just how smart they are. And, you know, conversations around human rights don't need to be difficult conversations. They can be deeply engaging, funny, um, powerful conversations that you want to have. Um, so I think that, you know, we always joke that we want to kind of rebrand the human rights conversation. Um, I don't know what the, whether the podcast can accomplish that or not, but I think what we want is for people to realize that y- you can have this conversation with your coworker who you know fled uh, another country to come to Canada. You can't have this conversation with uh, someone you know who was a victim of violence. It doesn't have to be this like difficult, um, difficult stuffy situation. You can actually engage with these people on a very basic, very human level, and it's going to do something for you. It's probably going to enrich your life. And so, hopefully, the conversations we have with people who are kind of living through various human rights situations can actually encourage people to get out there and have those conversations themselves. Because, like Gilad said, they're all around us all the time. I think, I think, okay, so the notion of rebranding the human rights conversation strikes me as very funny, um, <laughs> because it just, well, first of all, it presupposes there's even a human rights conversation going on, which I think is great, and I think it is going on, and I'm not trying to be, you know, to, to, to pick holes with you guys, I'm really not, I'm just trying to have a bit of fun with you, but but I love that you want to rebrand it, because I think that's awesome, and the fact that, you know, my, my comment to you, Galad, when you said about, well, it's, it's kind of like two guys having a conversation about human rights in a pub and i'm like are two guys really having a conversation about human rights in a pub <laughs> seriously i don't know if other people are, are but we always <laughs> there you go excellent so we're we're back to the hope again and i think that's that's very cool um so well what i find interesting about it the timing is really interesting with with you know uh all these syrian families 
you know, that are that are coming into Canada. I mean, 25,000 at least and, and, and more, uh, I would think, with other community-based organizations and faith-based organizations that are coming on board as well. And I think it's really incredible uh, what's happening at that level. So the timing for you guys in a, in a certain regard I I is perfect, it seems to me. Yeah, I mean, I, I hope so. I mean, I think the timing, the, the problem with the way the world is and right now is that there's never really a bad time to have a human rights conversation because there's always mm -hmm. something going on in the world that needs discussion. Um, but from a Canadian standpoint, I think the Syrian thing is actually a really important um, kickoff point for us because our, our first guest next week is a uh, North Korean refugee. And I think that refugees is another term that is super stigmatized. Oh, it sure is. And, and what, you'll, what you'll hear when you, when you listen to our podcast and our guest is that he's super funny and super smart and does a better job of making fun of Galat than I ever could. <laughs> and, um, and so, again, it's, it's sort of like this idea of getting away from the, uh, the stigma around these conversations, around the people who we assume are kind of downtrodden. And yes, they've been through difficult things in their life, but I guarantee you if you have a conversation with anybody coming over from Syria or North Korea or wherever it is, you will laugh, you will learn things that you never thought you'd learn, and it'll Frankly, if it doesn't sound too corny, it'll make you a better person. So well, you know that's what? what I'm hoping we'll Amar, do. Amar, I mean, Galad, you guys, what you, I think what you guys are doing, and this is your rebrand in my mind, you're humanizing the conversation, right? You're injecting a, a dose of humanity that one might not normally find, which is going to be evidenced through sense of humor and joking around, but at the same time making a significant point about, about the way things are. Right, and I mean, one of my favorite phrases: "You guys are going to make contact with reality in really fun, interesting, resonant, and meaningful ways." And that's—I don't know—that's just to me that's that's brilliant and timely, and 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 all those things. And I think uh, building on that, I think you know, a lot of the work that we do is is, is about building empathy with mm. whoever it is we're talking about, right? So. All of a sudden, you know, we're talking with a North Korean refugee, and he makes a joke. It's like, oh, man, that guy's kind of funny. Like, I can <laughs> right. see myself hanging out with that That's guy. Right. I want to learn more about his situation or his story. So it's sort of a gateway uh, into learning more about, about a certain, uh, you know, if it's a refugee crisis or if it's about uh, someone who is uh, a victim of violence. I think using that human side of them, just, I like to say empathy bridges. It's like we're building more empathy bridges with listeners. The, one of the things, uh, one of the thoughts I had recently was, you know, the, you know, thinking about the work that I do overseas and, and how do I sort of communicate to my students about, you know, just being cross-culturally effective and aware and this whole idea of listening is that a good, a good way for me now is to say bridge, bridge is already there. Bridge already exists. I just got to figure out how to get across it. And, you know, it's interesting. I was in a conversation today and I met a guy doing work. KC is his name. And he'd, he'd probably crossed the Gobi Desert seven times on horseback. He was a development guy. He did a lot of needs yeah. assessments and monitoring and evaluation for the UN. And what he would do is check this out. He would go in, he would live with the uh, Mongolian family, live, immerse himself in a community. And he used humor, humor to to connect, to build uh, these better relationships, to cross the bridges, and, and to humanize, I guess, the whole process of finding out more about uh, these people, their, the, their way of life, and, and so that he could come back and could write a substantive you know, monitoring and evaluation report. I, I, I just think it's fascinating. I mean, there's so, I mean, I think humor is really underrated, actually. Oh, absolutely. I think it's the easiest way to to kind of break the ice on these conversations, right? And I think we were joking about rebranding human rights, but I think human rights does have a brand. There are a lot of organizations that raise a lot of money with a certain type of messaging around human rights. Mm. Messaging is, is certainly serious, and it, of course it needs to be serious, and there needs to be a certain level of seriousness to it. It's obviously a very serious thing that they're doing. But um, the lack of humor and the lack of humanity around those types of messages are, I think, what keeps most people at arm's length from these conversations. Right. And so what we're hoping to do is kind of draw people into these conversations by breaking down some of those stereotypes around human rights conversations and human rights stories. And the, humor is the easiest, the, the best tool we've got. And frankly, we don't have to be that funny because the guests are really funny. And the people who have lived through, you know, there is a, a subject in, in my documentary who had spent five years in solitary confinement in a in Metro West Detention Center in Toronto. And 
by the end of the film, I realized he's he's the the comic relief in my documentary. He's wow. the one cracking jokes about his own wow. situation. He got up on stage at the premiere in Hot Docs and made 500 people keel over laughing. <laughs> and and this is a guy who spent five years in solitary. And yeah. So what what excuse do we have to not be funny and to not yeah. think about the humor yeah. in these things and use humor to our advantage to really create that, to really cross that bridge that Gilad was talking about? I agree. And listen, I'm Jewish. The only tools we really use are, are bagels and humor to get through anything. So <laughs> why not involve it in a podcast? So who who of the two of you is more sarcastic, or are you both kind of you both have big boxing gloves uh, with it when it comes to sarcasm? I'm not think sarcastic we're... at all. <laughs> yeah, I think we're. <laughs> I think we're. I'm definitely more. I'm. I'm sort of. More, I use like the angry sarcasm. <laughs> I'd use the sort of the empathetic sarcasm. Um, yeah, I, 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 there's usually a joke where Gilad usually uh, makes fun of me for going off on some sort of political rant or something like that. So you've so, done, you guys, um, you guys have done three interviews, and have you had honestly? Be honest here, because I'm, I'm just, I'm gonna, I'm gonna cut you off if if you aren't. Uh, but <laughs> I would have suggested and, that earlier. Yeah, it's exactly. Like I believe me, I've, uh, I've wanted to. I'm surprised times. we're still talking. <laughs> I know there's been several times, Gilad. Yeah. Um, any tension in the, th- the few interviews that you've done so far between the two of you? Uh, uh, disagreement? Uh, would you just sort of, uh, you know, crack a joke at that point? What 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 are you going to do when there's tension? Uh, when you're in the middle of an interview, you're going to just edit it out later, or are you going to leave it in? We we haven't had that yet, um, but I think it's probably coming because you know, in all apart from the jokes, we do have some disagreements sometimes when we talk about some of these human rights situations. So I think it's coming, but I don't see us editing it out because I think that's, A, it's going to be important for the audience to, to see who we really are and, and our dynamics as, as sort of co hosts But I think that, like, you know, it's just silly for, for us to be trying to make this really, like, raw, honest podcast and then edit out parts that we think embarrass us. So, um, yeah, I mean, that's, we're, we're going to try to be as honest as possible. That's the goal too. In those disagreements, or, or in those uh, in those moments where we don't see eye to eye, I, 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 it would be so stupid for us to remove that stuff. Yeah, and plus the audience is going to know I'm right and he's wrong. <laughs> I'm not <laughs> really <laughs> that worried. About it. Hey, listen, that's been crystal clear all the way through, Amar. So. <laughs> Listen, guys, thank you so much for your time today. We're just, uh, we're, we're, we, we got to wrap it up. Uh, any, any last sort of shameless self-promotion? Um, I'm going to certainly pump you online. Uh, we're going to tweet about you, but, uh, check it out. Uh, I'm going to do the, I'm going to do some of the, 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 the hum podcast, the, sorry guys, the hum <laughs> podcast.com. Check it out. That's spelt the hum, H-U-M podcast.com. Uh, Gilad Cohen, Mr. Walla. Uh, anything else, guys? You, anyone got a knock knock joke for us? I mean, before we get thing. to knock knock, I just want to say one thing. We are so uh, we're so excited to be on uh, CGRU uh, Ryerson Radio, nice. 1280 AM. Uh, we'll be featured on there. Our podcast episodes will be available on there as well, uh, starting in April. So big shout out to the kids at Ryerson. Cool. And what's the what are the what are the call uh, what's this call sign? Do the you know? radio station. It's CJRU. And it's 1280 a.m. There you go, 1280. That's what I was looking for, 1280 a.m. Cool. Well, good for you guys, and congratulations. I'll look forward to uh, checking out the, uh, the, the, the first interview. And, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, and thanks for being guests today. I re- really appreciate you being on the show. I thought you were our guest on our podcast. This is all very confusing. It is really confusing. <laughs> we're turning things upside down as we speak, yeah. Yeah, I think we'll just use this as one of our episodes, if you don't mind. <laughs> I, I, I think you should. Thanks for, cool. thanks, thanks for joining us today, guys. Thanks, thank you. Thank you.